The program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to South Africa. It was a stormy, temptuous night with howling winds. Unfortunately, not much rain. Now it's time to find out what's out and about after a long night. This is Safari Live. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here on the edge of the Kruger National Park. We're part of the eight and a half million acre Greater Kruger. I'm way down in the south of our traverse looking for a full come to love dearly. Her name is Karula and she's our dominant female. She's got two cubs presently and uh, we're hoping with that dark stormy night she's managed to make a kill. It's great hunting weather for the big cats. Uh, not so great if you're an impala or a kudu. But the one thing that is not so great for us is even that little bit of rain makes seeing her footprints that much harder. So we're going to go have a quick look up the southern boundary. When Byron lost her she was heading south which sometimes is never a good thing because it means she might be heading towards the of our traverse where we've just arrived and she might cross over. I think her cubs, uh, she left them down there but let's hope she made a kill between where Byron lost her and uh, our southern boundary. So we're just going to have a little trundle up the boundary uh, see if we can find uh, any sign of her and of course this is 100% live so please send us questions on using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter uh, or you can send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv Okay, Queen Karula, where are you? Now, there's still quite a bit of cloud around. It looked like it was breaking up. It's going to be interesting to see how it pans out in the morning. You can see it's quite dark in the west, but it's quite light in the east and the south. And our rain normally comes from the south and the east. See, it's one of those in-betweens. So. I don't know whether it's cold or whether it's warm. I think I'm going to put my jacket back on. It's a little bit chilly. There's a wind that's picked up. Um, it's theoretically not that cold. Around 24 degrees Celsius, which is in the 70s Fahrenheit. But oof. all of a sudden there's a chilly wind coming from the west. Are we going to get rain from the west? That would be quite unusual. So I'm guessing that if, if Karula's crossed, it's been somewhere between here and Weaver's Nest Road. So while I try scour the ground for tracks of the Queen, let's go say good morning to Pyron. Good morning, everyone. My name is Byron, and on camera with me this morning is Jandre. Um, and I'm not too sure what our plan is going to be for the day. Uh, I think why don't some of our viewers give us suggestions, see what we should do, what would you like to see, and then we can perhaps try to do that this morning. I am going to head across to Arethusa though. I'm just doing one or two radio tests on that side, but going to be heading across there. So give us your ideas, what you'd like us to look for and then uh, it might make it a bit easier for us who knows it's a nice lovely cool morning and uh, that should help us with with some animal movements possibly still get a lot more movement out of the animals because it is cooler but i wonder if it stays clear like this it could become quite warm later on While Brent is searching for Karula, he was searching yesterday and then she somehow just managed to pop out close to us. And I'm also just scanning for tracks. 
Ah. Elephant, yes, finally. I've been looking for elephant for how long? I'm just going to see if I can get a nice view. There seems to be a beautiful little baby there too. Hold on, maybe from this angle. There's one, one over there, there's a few around. There's a big female to the back, which we can't see just yet. She may come into our frame soon. And she's got a little calf with her. Oh, wonderful. I was saying the whole of yesterday, we haven't seen elephant in for ages and I've been looking all over for them. So I'm so glad we got, what a nice surprise. Great way to start the morning. This looks like a small herd. I don't see any others around at the moment. I can only count three large elephant and the one little calf. Oh, this little one just um, seems a little bit upset, possibly because that little calf is here. But that's just a more of a warning. Often you get And Philip, all the way from New York, you're also hoping to see elephant. Well, there we go. Um, now, sometimes these little teenagers, uh, um, these younger elephant, do try and test us a little bit. They, they want to see if we're a threat, if we're a danger, and if they're able to th chase us away. See that head shake, all little signs that it wants to try and intimidate us and get us to move away. But it's not really aggression as such and it, as I said it is a younger elephant so we generally don't have to worry too much I'd like to sit here a little bit and see if that calf does decide to come out still can't really see it I get a glimpse every now and then but we're gonna wait here a bit lovely to see these elephants <laughs> windy this morning. The wind's picked up quite a bit. Sometimes it can cause elephants to be a little bit uneasy purely because they rely on their sense of smell and their hearing and if it's very very windy those senses become a lot harder to use. Oh, I love watching elephants just the way they, they feed they're incredibly intelligent ability to use that trunk to pull out tiny little weeds or leaves that they're feeding on or grass shoots and then obviously the power that they have to be able to break branches and chew on massive stumps or, or um, branches to strip off bark really is incredible they seem as if they've settled down that one's not as worried about us anymore I always say a feeding elephant is a happy elephant. And I think that female with her calf is going to be coming through. There we go, look there. Oh, wonderful. That's a young little one. I wonder, it could possibly be, it's always difficult to really gauge age, but uh, judging by the size, I'd say close to a year old. Uh, Rose, newborn elephant or not born blind, they they're born precocial, which means they are able to stand up and move around very, very soon after birth. So it wouldn't help if they were blind. Um, they, um, they obviously need to get up and move around with the herd for safety reasons. So they're not born blind at all. Just like many of the antelope species, or all the antelope species, the giraffe, um, buffalo, 
zebra, all those animals, all the young are born precocial, which means they are able to not quite fend for themselves, but they're able to get up and start moving around um, with, the, with the female, with the mother. Um, animals that are born altricial, which means completely helpless, would be leopard cubs, lion cubs. Um, they, you know, they are born into a den and the females have to look after them for a few months. They are born blind and helpless. Just like we, we basically born altricial, completely helpless. Breaks. Sorry. And there they go. They seem a little bit restless this morning for some reason. There goes the big female with the calf. Oh, what a lovely, lovely view. how quickly these elephants can move out of an area when they want to. And there's still one just off to our left. So I just want to keep an eye on it. Don't want to get between it and the and the rest that might decide to run across the road. Let's see just hiding behind this bush. Let's just wait here. As I said, I don't want to get between it and the other elephant. That can sometimes cause the elef elephant to be a bit unhappy, maybe feel a bit distressed. But this one seems okay. We'll see when it decides to come out into the open once it decides to follow the others, which I do think might be fairly soon because the others are moving off quite quickly. For some reason that female with the calf is not interested in staying out in the open. She's moving away very, very quickly. This young elephant has some beautiful little tusks already. Mike, uh, you wanted to know if the smaller tusks mean is it a juvenile? Oh, look at that. <laughs> running away, trying to catch up to the others now. Um, Mike, not necessarily. Um, and I, I say that because, well, generally speaking, smaller tusks, yes, you would you would imagine to see on uh, on a smaller elephant or younger elephant. Um, but occasionally, some elephant, you know, their the tusks don't grow out at all. That can happen at times. <laughs> Look at it running off there. Um, but with a lot of the younger elephant, you do see much smaller, thinner tusks. And then obviously the older they get, they do get a lot larger, longer and thicker. Generally, generally speaking, that is what happens. Um, so occasionally with females, their tusks might not necessarily get as thick as males, but they do get quite long. Um, and, but like I said, you might find an elephant where the tusks haven't grown out at all. And that can happen and does happen on occasion. Look at the rain. No. Look at the rain in the distance. Look at that. Beautiful. Elihu, you want to know how long do the calves stay with the mother? So with elephant, um, the young female calves, um, even the young males, they'll stay within that herd. Um, but the best i think the best way to describe it is when the when the young males leave a herd and that's usually around the age of maybe between 15 and 20 somewhere around there and they'll they'll potentially move off and meet up with the big dominant male and the reason for that is those big dominant males will help teach those younger males how to be successful where to look for food and how to find females so just here's something in there 
a big dung beetle that I'll have to get out soon. Um, so uh, the the rest of the rest of the young elephant will stay within the herd. The young females stay within that herd. They just grow the numbers. In terms of when the youngsters suckle from the mothers, some young elephant will will continue to try and suckle from a mother anywhere up to five years, even a bit longer if they're lucky. They'll still try try and get some milk from the mother, but generally the average is between between two and four um, where they do suckle and then they'll they'll stop but they'll stay within that herd and they'll just grow the, the size of the herd beautiful to see that rain in the distance uh, Ali you want to know are there any animals in the Kruger that uh, the, where the fathers are involved in the upbringing of the offspring? Now, now let me think. Let me think. Uh, good question, Ali. Um, I definitely know of some birds, and I'll get to that now. I'm just trying to think of animals first. Um, uh, Certain animals like jackal, uh, you, uh, like we've got side striped jackal that we do see in this area, and they generally stay in pairs, the male and female, and the female will give birth to the pups, but um, but the male will still be around and probably provide food for them too. So I don't know to what extent he he, he raises the pups. So it's mainly the female's role, but they stay in small family groups, um, a small little pack of jackal I suppose you could call it um, and then um, uh, wild dogs wild dogs I'm trying to think uh, see the wild dogs you have an alpha male and female but the whole pack looks after the female and her youngsters so probably not warthogs perhaps um, but generally generally the males do move off on their own after a while um, you might get to see a, a group where a male and a female are together with some some youngsters but I don't think the males really have much to do with the, the upbringing of offspring now birds however one of the best known birds for doing this is the African jacana and I'll show you a picture of one quickly um, and they are very very interesting birds the African jacana and I'll tell you why it's because the um, the females, uh, let me just find it quickly. Not quite the females, but the males are the ones that uh, that raise the young, not the females. So <laughs> it's funny, but the females literally mate with the males, lay the eggs, and then the males are the ones that will sit on the on the nest and incubate the eggs and then raise the chicks and have a look at that that's the male or the african jacana this beautiful bird over there and uh, some people refer to them as lily trotters but they they've got the largest feet in proportion to body size than any other bird um, in Africa so they spread their weight evenly on reeds so that they're able to walk around the water and on the water and um, and these birds are always always found near water dams occasionally rivers but mainly dams and larger water holes so this is known as polyandrous where the males look after the chicks um, or the young and not the females and the females may also have more than one male partner so they may potentially have two or three different male partners that they will mate with lay the eggs and then the males will sit on the nest and incubate the, the chicks and look after the chicks when they when they have isn't that interesting? All right, and Aaron, you, um, we are heading towards Arethusa, so towards that airstrip area. Perhaps we can have a look for jackal and secretary birds down there. I know you'd like to see them, and who knows? While I head in that direction, let's head back to Brent and see how his leopard tracking is going. 
we're still searching for the queen. Uh, we didn't find any tracks on the southern boundary, but with the rain, it's quite easy we could have missed one. Hello, Kodul. You seen a leopard this morning? No? You look quite relaxed. Rough night last night, all those strong winds, lightning, thunder. There you go, female kudu. Mm, not looking too stressed, not like there's a leopard close by. Here comes another one. Now, it looks like the sun's going to win the battle today. Break up the cloud. Just want to listen for a second. Still no signs of alarm calls. No signs of tracks just yet. I'm going to check the treehouse waterhole. Now, Byron lost her going into this area, but oh, after this rain, if she walked here before the rain, the chances of us seeing a track are, are very slim. Some of the sections of road here are quite hard. Paul, uh, Paul's wondering why we can't cross boundaries. Are those areas off limit to all vehicles uh, or are they owned by different landowners? Uh, they are owned by different landowners and our Travis agreement in this part of the Sabi Sands is only with Juma, Cheetah Plains and Arethusa. So other lodges can drive in those areas. Unfortunately, for now, we can't. Okay, we're approaching the treehouse waterhole. And there's been that not so well looking hippo he's been here for the last couple of days but maybe oh no he hasn't moved but let's get up onto the damn wall he's still here he would have been hoping for quite a lot more rain fill up his little pond So hippos will graze at night uh, and try to return to the water during the day and try to protect themselves from the blistering African sun. Now he's been in a battle with another hippo bull at some stage and a battle it looks like he lost. Now the ox peckers are pro proving quite the nuisance, keeping some of those wounds open so they can feed off his blood. You can see how pink and raw those wounds are, and that's almost exclusively from the ox peckers. Now, Julie was wanting to come check up on this hippo. Well, here we are, Julie. Oh, shame, poor guy. Now, the two animals that have taken the biggest knock from the droughts is definitely the hippo and uh, the, the buffalo. What always amazes me is the, the terrapins. I mean, they've gone through this drought. They've been hiding and keeping their heart rates low. And as soon as there's this tiny bit of water, if we look in the corner, yeah, there's, oh, oh difficult to say, but 20, 30, little heads popping in and out. There we go. Hello, terrapins. They've actually got quite a nasty bite on them. Now, they don't really have teeth, but their, their whole bottom, their whole bone, or their whole jaw is bone, and they've got that very sharp sort of point at that, at that apex of the mouth. And they are capable of quite some nips. Okay, well, bye-bye, Mr. Hippo. Bye.
Not by mis all the terrapins. We've got leopards to find. Morning, Aubrey. Just a small climb in Law of Mobile West at uh, Junction Philemon's Dip, Zoe's Road. Copy. Um, yeah, I've checked around Treehouse and around the boundary. I'm heading towards Twin Dams. Hi, Amber. Amber's wondering, would a hippo get sunburned if it was out of the water? Uh, it's sort of sunburned. What happens is the skin dries out and becomes quite... Uh, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm not brittle, but it dries out quite quickly and can crack and be very painful. Now hippos secrete uh, a pinky oily substance that also works as a bit of a sunblock, but uh, they, they are specifically designed not to wander around in the day. Even though they've got incredibly thick skin, it is quite sensitive. Now still so, so far no sign of a queen carula, but we're going to keep checking. We're going to head a little bit further to the east, down towards the Mawati River. Maybe she popped down there. Oh, she could have gone any direction from that block. Now we've checked to the west and we've checked to the south. We haven't checked to the east and north yet, so that's where we're heading. And you notice we're not seeing nearly as much general game as we used to. Uh, not as much. Oh, there used to be lots of zebra around, lots of waterbuck, and uh, giraffe as well. We had quite a few buffalo, but now with the rain, they've all spread out far and wide, and they would have moved to areas that might have had a little bit better rain than us, and there's nice luscious green grass uh, there for them to feed. Also, a lot of those areas that don't have permanent water, but now with rains, those little mud wallows f fill up. Uh, gives them an opportunity to spread into other areas and utilize other areas at a different time of the year. Well, hi Julia. Julia says, is there an Another name for the European cuckoo we saw yesterday. She can't seem to find it on her bird app. I think in Europe it's called a common cuckoo, Julia. Uh, so a common cuckoo, we call it a European cuckoo here because it migrates all the way from Europe to visit us. But I think uh, in Europe it is called a common cuckoo. Oh, you st what are you still doing out and about? There we go. Little scrub here. Oh, got a fright from a diker and scattered off. The diker ran, the scrub there thought, well, there must be something dangerous around like a leopard. I'm out of here. So, those are normally nocturnal and uh, spend their evenings out grazing on grass. And you can see those massive ears are one of their best forms of defense against predators. They've also got good eyesight. But one of the interesting things about scrub hares and is that they eat their own feces up to seven times. So they're not uh, to enable them to get the maximum amount of nutrients out of it as possible. Uh, this also enables them to utilize areas that are quite dry and where the vegetation might not be the best. Okay, we're nearly back down on the southern boundary where we started this morning and uh, instead of going to the west, we're going to go to the east this time. Covering all our bases. It is going to be quite difficult to see tracks today, but hopefully the eyes are working. And uh, hopefully Karula makes it easy for us. We don't have to track. Maybe we'll just spot her.
Okay, now we're back on the southern boundary. My head is going to be fixed to the ground again while I try check for tracks. So while we do that, uh, let's go see what's happening on Arethusa with Byron. So we've just crossed onto Arethusa. Um, we're heading down to the southwest towards their airstrip. But just having a look at this beautiful rain in the distance. And actually, I'd like to show you something because we don't often get to see this. I'm just going to look for a little gap quickly. Hold on. I think up front we might get a gap through there. Scanning, also checking around these areas. Now, we have had wild dogs occasionally running through here um, recently on Arethusa, just the southern section. Apparently, they've been getting glimpses of them, they haven't been hanging around. There we go, just uh, through here, perhaps. Hold on. Now, with all that rain at the moment, what's happening is it's obviously cleared up the air uh, quite a bit. So it has settled all the dust and uh, that kind of hazy view that we do get. But um, for the moment, you can see the Drakensberg mountain range clearly, very, very clearly in the distance. Now, that's the largest mountain range which runs through South Africa starts up right up in the northeastern part of South Africa and extends quite far south and then through across the central part of South Africa and it um, basically separates the escarpment or the high-lying areas of South Africa to these lower-lying areas so we're in an area known as the low felt um, our altitude here is much much lower than that of the escarpment above on top of the mountain range or um, through the mountain range but it's very very clear this morning it looks like they have moved closer oh, that is a really really beautiful beautiful view nice to see how clear the air is after all this rain uh, I'm just going to help a friend down here quickly. He seems to be a little stuck. Come here. Oh, look at that. Hello. See if he's going to fly. There we go. <laughs> nice big dung beetle. Cindy, you wanted to know if because of that, or oh, we had that very big drought, that bad drought, you wanted to know if there was any anthrax around in the season. Um, Cindy, I haven't seen any or heard of any reports yet. Um, I mean, it, you know, fortunately now there's been quite a bit of rain, so that does help a lot. But uh, no, I haven't heard of any outbreaks or any, any incidents. is nice. Also just scanning for any tracks and I think I see some kudu, there we go. Some young kudu bulls, two of them. They will still get much bigger, those horns will get a bit bigger, but beautiful to see them. One of the largest antelope that we have in this area. Those beautiful big ears. Now the kudu do prefer moving through thickets. 
as we can see Um, and they've got those large ears to help listen out for potential predators in these thick areas. Now you'd think that those kudu with those very, very long spiral horns would struggle to move through thickets like this, and especially if they've been chased by something. But incredibly what they do is, if they do run away from anything, all they do is the males drop their heads. And I say the males because only the males have horns, not the females. As they're running, they'll just tilt their head back a little bit and what it does is it pushes those horns straight back down along the back and they're able to run through thickets very very easily then so they can get through the branches without those horns getting caught on them. Just tilt their heads back slightly. As you can see there's a lot of little pans in that around at the moment. Um, a little, little bit of water around. All these little pans have warmed up, um, warmed up, filled up. I think we've got somewhere around around 15 or 20 mils of water of rain last night. Have a look here, just off to the right. I mean, this filled up quite a quite a bit. Now, in these little mud wallows, possibly find little terrapins already moving around. But that's great. So all that that means too is that the animals can get water just about anywhere now. While they're walking around, they will drink from these little mud wallows or these little little pools of water which are formed. Ilana, you want to know what is the difference between terrapins and turtles? So terrapins are basically just freshwater turtles. Turtles are generally, they live in salt water in the oceans. Um, I know, I think you've got, um, I think in the United States you've got a snapper turtle, which is much larger, but I, I'm, I don't know the exact habitat that it lives in. I know in swamplands and that, but I think because of the size, I think it also falls under the turtle family, but generally turtles live in seawater um, or salt water and terrapins are smaller, much, much smaller and live in fresh water. There's some impala up ahead. Michael, you wanted to know why we're watching this impala. You wanted to know what is anthrax? Is it a disease of sorts? Um, and to be honest, I don't really like chatting about these diseases if there's no sign of them at all because it can occasionally cause a bit of panic um, when there's no reason to panic because there's no sign of anthrax at all, especially now we've had a lot of rain. So what happens is um, um, there are little spores, um, if I remember this correctly, tiny little spores which can be airborne and it affects animals um, and can cause animals to, to die. It's a, it's, a, um, it's a bacteria if I'm not mistaken which is uh, usually caused by drought and very very dry conditions but at the moment we've got a lot of rain so we don't have to worry about it at all but it does affect animals and it does kill animals so it is an airborne disease um, and animals do pick up on it in droughts in very very severe droughts at the Arethusa airstrip. 
I wonder if there'll be any little creatures running around here in the open. going to do is let's actually just go out and just scan around here yeah, it's going to open up fairly fairly sh soon very big airstrip this very open airstrips are often used by animals um, and I'm just trying to have a look around here to our right you can still see some of the impala that are moving off <clears throat> as I was saying these open areas these open airstrips and that are often used by animals for safety in the evenings you can just see some of the um, impala Probably moving back into the thickets for the day to go and feed and look for food. I'm just scanning very carefully just to see if we can. Uh, James, you wanted to know what sort of antelope species we could potentially find on the Drakensberg um, in their mountain range. So, up in those areas, we do get, um, um, I think, there are mountain reedback which occur around there, but one of the more um, prevalent uh, antelope that do occur in that area are the earlunt, the very, very large earlunt. Now, that is the largest antelope in Africa, and I'll show you a picture of one now um, there we go and they do enjoy mountainous areas and you can see that's the earlunt they are massive some of the big earlunt bulls just to give you an idea of size can be larger than buffalo they are very 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 big big antelope massive they are incredibly large some of them can weigh up to 800 kilograms or a ton that's really really big um, then uh, also kudu a lot of kudu up in those mountainous areas of the Drakensberg those would probably be the more common um, antelope up there and then also you might find little antelope known as clip springer um, I'll show you a little picture of them now uh, Clip Springer directly translated means rock jumper and there it is it's a beautiful antelope they do prefer rocky areas you do get some of them up in those areas that's that's the male and the female and they they've got uh, very interesting or very interesting hoof structure almost like little toes that uh, that these these hooves um, form a little point and it's almost like a rubberized hoof gives them a lot of grip on these very steep edges and rocky areas and they're able to jump and spring from one rock to another very very easily and that's where the name clip springer means rock jumper Now we do get clip spring in this area too. Um, it's just uh, so um, with the clip springers, we do get them in these areas within the Sabi sands, and that I've seen many clip springers around. But this area that we operate on on Juma, we don't have any little rocky outcrops, so we won't really see them out here. They do live and prefer rocky outcrops, but just south of us, so in that direction over there, just. Uh, you know, just south of us, south of Arethusa. Um there's uh, and you can actually see the landscape changes slightly, it does look as if it appears to dip down and that leads towards a river known as the Sand River 
and along the Sand River there was a fa there fault lines over, over thousands of years caused rocky outcrops to form along the edges of the Sand River and those rocky outcrops um, are actually perfect homes for Clip Springer so um, uh, you do get them around there and I've seen many Clip Springer around these areas Right, I'm going to scan this airstrip a little bit more, have a look if we can't find Jackal. But let's head back to Brent and get an update from him. Well, uh, no success on Queen Karula just yet, but I got a radio call and I'm on my way to a surprise. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Uh, if you'd like to guess, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or questions at wildearth.tv on email. What surprise are Hart and Brent going to this morning? Uh, unfortunately, it just did happen to be on the complete opposite side of the reserve to where we were. Uh, we were in the sort of south middle part of the reserve and whatever was found was right up in the western corner of the reserve so rushed across quarantine I'm now on the main access road heading towards that area You never know what we might bump to on the way though, there's always something out there and that's the wonderful thing about being on a live African safari. Oh, wonder what it is, wonder what it is. Well, of course I don't need to wonder, I know. Well, Sorav thinks it might be wild dogs. Mm, am I going fast enough for wild dogs? I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. It might be a bird. Maybe. Could it be a thick billed cuckoo? There's definitely still quite a lot of rain towards the Drakensberg. Dark skies up ahead, but as I said, very unusual for us to get weather from that side of the world. I don't think we had much rain last night. I don't think we even had three mils or four mils. So, not too much. But it will help the grass. Hopefully, Cheetah Plains got a bit more. As I, we were down there yesterday, and you could see the sun was actually burning the grass. Pokemon guy says an odd fuck, a honey badger, and maybe a pangolin. Wow, imagine all those, all of those three together. I, I've never seen any of those together, but you never know. I've seen what of those have I seen together? I've seen odd fuck and leopard together, alive and dead. I've seen honey badger and lion together. I've seen pangolin and lion together. Seen. I've never seen an art fark and lion together. One of the reasons uh, a lot of those creatures, especially the art fark, come out late at night around 11 o'clock is because uh, it falls outside of the lion's most active window. So lions are generally quite active from sunset or just after sunset 
uh, for the next two two to three hours after there. So and this is from about seven to ten, sometimes eleven, and you find a lot of things like artfark, uh, pangolin will actually come out after that to avoid coming into contact uh, with leopard and lion who have a little bit of a, a lapse off. They go for another nap during that time. Not always, but as as a general rule. Okay, we're now on the western boundary. Whoa, Aaron and Michael are hoping it's young Sindile, the male leopard. Well, I don't know. Could it be? We're going to have to wait to find out. So while I get towards that spot, uh, let's go see what Steph's up to on foot. Yes, good morning and uh, welcome to the bushwalk part of this morning's uh, safari or sunrise safari. I am Steph Vinterbur on camera today. We are VM. And, um, you might be asking yourself, why do we walk around like this? Well, walking around is one of the ways that Africa has been explored, I suppose next to being explored on horseback, as the most, or the oldest way of getting around really. And it just adds such a nice perspective to the vehicle-based safaris, which of course get you a lot closer to the bigger things that have a slightly different priority to what we do. Our job out here is to walk into the middle of big undisturbed blocks of bush and to uncover whatever we can in there both large and small but I must be honest with you mostly small what are we doing today oh as you may have been told by Brent or by who else is out there today Byron. <laughs> um, that it rained last night and there's quite a stiff breeze blowing around at the moment the breeze is coming from this side here which is have a look at the blue sky it's coming from our west and northwest usually wind that comes from the west or the northwest blows away the clouds in this particular instance i think it's doing exactly that but what that does mean is we've got to put our faces into the wind and try as much as we can keep this breeze blowing into our faces what that does is it takes all our scent and blows it away from the area that we are approaching and that's just one of the ways that we keep ourselves safe over here we don't want to disturb anything out here we don't want to if, as far as what we can at least anyway we want to walk around here unobserved and unobtrusive and one of the ways we do that is using the wind direction so we're going to be walking around probably the Jumek dam area today and on top of the crest there there's a seep line there with a nest of a little bee eater and we can go and visit that from time to time i've been there over the last couple of months and it's been so nice we actually managed to find the nest it'd be nice to see if they've managed to fledge a chick in the meantime and see if there are more than one of the little bee eaters over there so that's my plan i'll probably get sidetracked along the way it happens so often out here and we'll see what happens um what else could we expect I'd like to see an elephant really. We haven't seen an elephant in an age on the bushwalk, and especially this time of the year. The big bulls are coming into the Sabi Sands. No one really knows why. Generally, they only really come for the marulas, which start to ripen up in about February and well, through to April, really. Um, but right now, in the, whoa, look at this. The granddaddy of all millipedes. This is incredible. Look at the size of this guy. That's my hand. He's a good, oh, easily double my hand. He's come out after the rain, and that is about as big as a millipede gets here. That is massive. Easily just shy of a foot long. I don't actually know anywhere in the world that you get larger millipedes than here, to be honest. I'm sure you do. We are, we, we are not a tropical uh, environment whatsoever. In actual fact, we're savannah, almost semi-arid, I would imagine. And these types of animals and creatures do very, very well in marine environments, but they also do very, very well in rainforests. But just have a look at that. It's thicker than what my thumb is. That is incredible. 
got a covering of mud and sand from where he was hiding out during the storm I would imagine probably in some cavity somewhere or actually in this termite mound made up of many many different segments Let's see if you wouldn't mind me picking me up sometimes these big these big millipedes don't mind you picking them up but just have a look I'll give you my I'm a size 9 shoe and that is about as long as my foot is <laughs> that's massive <laughs> They're detritivores, mainly. I'll tell you something interesting that I learned just the other day. So what does detritivore mean? It means that they feed on composting material, on compost basically. They eat fungus, they eat algae, they eat dead and dying leaves and trees and branches. But they will also feed on dead and dying insects. And the other day a friend of mine acquaintance really more than a friend managed to take a sequence of photographs which showed a millipede approaching a dying locust wrapping the locust up in its coils and then starting to feed on it isn't that incredible so in that sense you could say that it was a scavenger perhaps carnivore because the animal wasn't dead yet Just have a look here. I'm gonna walk, he doesn't like me going around his business end. He said one of his feelers have been chopped off in a fight or something. That is how they see their world, is those antennae that's waving around there in the front. Jay, you wanted to know if millipedes have a smell. Jay, um, you can see some of its dung there. That has a smell, absolutely. And more than a smell, they've got a taste, believe it or not. Underneath their legs, where their legs come out of their bodies, let's see if I can open it there again, there are pores there. And those pores exude a hydrocyanide, which, may, uh, which coats the top of the millipede and makes them taste incredibly bad. Now what you might find on big millipedes like this are travelers as well. Let's see if we can find some mites. Quite often they're infested with mites. This one is very clean. He hasn't got any mites at all. And what the mites do is keep him clean as well. Living in the environment where he lives or she lives, it's actually an it, they're hermaphroditic. Um, they pick up any number of fungi that grow on their bodies and mites will live on their bodies cleaning them off. I think we've played with this guy enough, we'll leave him going in his original direction. <laughs> Ilana! You've just asked me how many legs do millipedes have? They get their name milli, meaning thousand, and pedi, meaning legs, but they don't really have a thousand legs. What they have got is they've got two legs per segment, two pairs of legs per segment. So you can take a screen grab here, a picture. Let's do that with you. Let's see if we can get him to sit still so that you can grab a picture. There we go. And then in your leisure time, you can count how many segments he's got. The first four segments only have one pair of legs, and the last segment has one pair of legs. Every other segment has two pairs of legs. And then you can absolutely see how many legs this, and this is a very long one. They will very rarely have more legs than this. <laughs> crawling right into your screens this morning. All right, on that note, we're going to be sending you over to Brent, who's got a surprise for you. Well, well done to Safari Shay. You are correct. It is indeed the Incahumas. Only four of them. So it probably 
Amber Eyes, who's still missing. She's probably out with him for more. Last we heard in Buffle's Hook. But look at that fat bellies. Now, apparently they did kill two buffalo when they went visiting our neighbours. But lovely to have them back. They're not far inside Juma at the moment. Probably only 50 or 60 metres. Yeah, uh, so far I counted four cubs, but I think there are some others behind this bush here where there's another adult lioness. So I think all the cubs are here. We will move around just now, but at the moment this is the, the best spot. There we go. There we go. You can see a few more behind. So we can see four in total, but I'm sure the others can't be too far off around the corner. And we've got some cleaning going on on the right. So the only lioness missing is Amber Eyes. And as I said, we think she's with the authority Mfumo. Um, she might be coming into Eastress, so that's why she's not with the pride. I can't see any males with them at the moment, but that doesn't mean Tino is not lying about here somewhere. Hey, little guy. They definitely have picked up condition and picked up condition quickly. And as soon as they did, you can see they've started moving distances again which they weren't doing for about 10 days or so during the height of the white muscle disease. Very peaceful, serene sighting this morning. It doesn't look like they've got a kill around here, even though last night would have been ideal hunting weather. I think their bellies were just too big to make the effort. Remember the hashtag Safari Live or the email address questions at wildearth.tv if you'd like to ask us any questions. Just waiting for Aubrey, and thanks to Aubrey for finding them to move out and then we'll try get into a, a better spot. I know a lot of you are very happy to see the Ngormas back on Juma. Okay, Aubrey's out. Let's just try and maneuver, see if we can see the rest of the cubs. There we go. Let's do a quick cub count. Okay, so there's one bar sleeping behind that line. There's two, three, four, five, six. All present and accounted for. Probably walked from where they were yesterday. 4Ks, 
four kilometers, five kilometers. Okay. Kay is wondering, is there still a chance of mange now that it's rained? Um, well, Kay, generally things like mange are, are prevalent when it's very dry and uh, the mites seem to not do so well in the, in the wet. Now, I mean, there's always a chance, but it's highly unlikely, I think, that the danger of mange uh, has passed with every little raindrop we get becomes less and less uh, of uh, well, the chances of mange taking over become less and less even the little cubbies have nice fat bellies Alina is wondering how do lions get TB and uh, well, they generally get it from buffalo, uh, bovine tuberculosis that transmits into feline TB, mutates, should I say, is the correct word. But uh, so far with uh, this set of Inkahuma cubs and, and the adults, I don't see any signs of TB. Wh what's happened over the last 10 years, now this is not fact, but it's, it's, it's looking more and more likely, it's, it's my theory, is that when when the the lions first started contracting TB from from the buffalo, there was a, a massive influence on the lion populations, and this is where genetics and 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 not getting involved becomes a very important thing, because as you just leave them alone and you let the TB work through the, the cats. Some of the prides get completely wiped out and obviously they don't have a good genetic resistance to that. Where there is a, a lot of the prides now probably carry TB but it, it has no adverse effects on them. We're not seeing those lumps on the elbows um, or on, on the neck like you normally see in, in TB lions. So you probably find there might be carriers but it's now almost um, not mundane but inert their, their, their genetics are strong enough to deal with it oh it's seen a bug oh it's a biting fly bite it here we go now she's probably going to jump up and uh, walk over to one of the other lionesses. Now, lions are quite funny because often they'll just flop on top of another lioness. Now, who are you going to go flop on? Or are you going to go flop on someone? Oh, she's got a thorn in her bum. There you can see a little thorn stick stuck in it. Doesn't seem to be affecting her at all. She might be just going to find a, another spot to lie down. I'm hoping they might get moving, but uh, it's going to be difficult to see with those fat bellies and they've moved quite far overnight. There's a good chance that they're just going to snooze in this area. There's enough shade around. Uh, there's water close by. Now, I know a lot of you, when you're lying down or watching Safari Live, you like to put your feet up. And here, our lions also like to do that from time to time. And if we have a look at this lioness, there we go. She's got a nice foot rest in a little uh, sickle bush or Dicrostachus. She looks quite comfortable. I'm quite jealous.
So it's going to be interesting to see if Amber Eyes joins up with them at some time. Uh, she has looked the last time we saw her like she was trying to find the pride. But then uh, she lost them and she went the wrong way. She went north instead of south west. So they are heading back towards where she was. She was about a kilometre and a half inside Buffalo's Hook on yesterday's sunset safari. Hi Liz. Liz in Chicago is wondering, does oestrus happen monthly for lions? Well, no it doesn't. So once they've had babies, Liz, uh, they will suppress their oestrus cycle till those babies are big enough to mate for themselves. So till, if it's a male lion, till they disperse and go look for their own pride, or if it's a female, till she's sexually viable. Till then, uh, the mothers will not have an oestrus cycle. And you see another lioness using a different foot list, but while the Inkahumas are napping, uh, I'm going to sit chat, see what they get up to next. But uh, let's go see what Byron's plans are. Uh, we've just come to a beautiful little water hole that's filled up a lot during the course of the evening with some rain. But listen to all the frogs. Isn't that amazing? Wonderful, wonderful sounds. Some rain frogs, some um, uh, uh, painted reed frogs. A lot of them. A lot of them here at the moment. A lot of frogs. It's incredible. I can't see a single one. I can just hear them. I've been scanning, looking carefully with the binoculars. Can't see them. But this cacophony of frog calls coming from this little water hole after the rain. And then another beautiful bird sitting at the top of this very dead tr tree, top right hand branch, uh, sorry that, that one over there, genre, top right is a hoopoo, let's see if we can get it there, there it's sitting, it's calling non-stop, there it is, the African hoopoo. Beautiful call. Some wonderful sounds coming from this area at the moment. Bird calls and the frog calls. Really beautiful spot. We caught a glimpse of something interesting earlier. As we were just driving around this open clearing, a glimpse of a white-tailed mongoose, which is very interesting, especially for this time of the morning. They're generally nocturnal. I'll show you a picture of one, those who don't know what a white-tailed mongoose looks like. Um, it's the largest mongoose species in Africa. Let's see if I can find it quickly. Hang on. Um, and like I said, they're mainly nocturnal, so to see one running around early in the morning is very interesting. I'm trying to find it. Where is it? Very, very large mongoose. I wonder if they've got a picture of a white-tailed mongoose in here. Not a, not a very good one, but that's a picture of a white-tailed mongoose. Doesn't really do it any justice. They, they generally much dark with very large, bushy white tails. And as I said, they're mainly nocturnal. I don't know where this picture is from. But, um, but to see one running around in the morning like this through the clearing is very interesting. And just a quick little view and it disappeared so quickly. Very, very shy little creatures. A big bird of prey that's just flying over us. What is that? A 
that's interesting. I wonder why that bird. Let's see if I can have a closer look at it. It flew away from us. It looked like perhaps a tawny eagle or a step buzzard. So some of you might be wondering where I am. You haven't seen this pan before. We're just off Arethusa airstrip. And um, and I think it's just because of all the rain that's filled up now. There goes that bird. Oh. Uh, it looked like a tawny eagle. I think I might be able to get a view of it for you. Hold on. Um, through here. It looked like a tawny eagle that took off and possibly feeding on some termites. Uh, they do do that occasionally, especially after a lot of rain. When all these termites are active, you do get some of these larger birds of prey coming down and feeding on the termites. Let's see if I can. It doesn't look like it's flown off. It's still sitting up in this tree. Uh, it's just quite a thick little tree. Uh, you can kind of get it through the genre. Can you see? So we're in that marula, the left hand main left hand stem, it's sitting just next to. go there it is it does look like a tawny eagle beautiful beautiful color it's just hiding in the in those branches at the moment Let's just double check. I'll show you some of the eagle species that that look quite similar. But I think this coloration is probably spot on with this picture of the tawny eagle. Have a look at that. So, fortunately, with these apps, you do have photographs of some of the. Uh, sorry, there we go. How's that? There you can see that coloration clearly. Um, and one of the things we look for is the, the beak and the sear, how far back it goes. Generally, with the tawny, it does go quite far back, almost to the back of the eye around there. Um, and also tawny eagles tend to look a little bit ruffled. Their feathers always look a little bit ruffled. I'll show you another bird quickly that looks similar. Uh, step eagles sometimes. And look how similar that step eagle looks. To that, um, and this is an immature step eagle, this picture, but very, very similar to the tawny eagle. Let's just see if there's another picture of one here. Uh, there we go, you can see I'm sitting there too. See, but now that sear, the little sear at the back there is meant to extend beyond the eye but like I say it's so difficult to actually have a good look at it and I, I do think I do think we get it wrong sometimes to be honest um, because it's not always easy to see even with binoculars and scanning and trying to have a look at these eagles quickly and when they're hiding through trees um, to really have a good look and and gauge whether or not it is a step eagle or tawny eagle if the coloration is so similar and if you don't get a good look at that sear and again i wonder how accurate that that is because from the pictures that i've shown you it looks like they're almost exactly the same But I do think that this is a tawny eagle.
right, we're going to continue moving through this area. Um, just having a look around these clearings uh, that we've passed through and see if there's anything else interesting around here. While I do that, let's head back to Steph on the bushwalk and see what he's up to. Quite nice jumping from Arethusa from from where Byron is all the way to us. I would suppose that it's about 10 miles from where he is at the moment. It's relatively far. And you come over in an instant looking at birds in the sky with Byron to coming to look at this funny patch of white deposit that you're seeing over here. Now what this is, it's a latrine site for an African civet. They use toilet sites to mark out their territory and it's a little bit like playing crime scene investigations because it tells you what is the most predominant food source in that area or in this area at this time for the civet and because they're omnivorous and have this really wide diet you can tell what the bush is doing by coming to one of these sites, these newsstands for lack of a better word. So why don't we go through the, 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 the civet deposits and we see what we can find, what the civet's been eating. This is immediately noticeable in that it's the belly of a scorpion, I think. Is it a scorpion? Yeah, it's the scorpion. So this is the main body of a scorpion and here some tail segments of a scorpion probably the same scorpion there we go let's see what else we can find over here of note is baby tortoises so this civet has been feeding on a young tortoise that's a scoot from a tortoise many millipedes Many, many millipedes. All of these white pieces here and here are the segments of a millipede. Let's see if we can find something else interesting here. Here is a dung beetle. So the front foot of a dung beetle, or one of the feet of a dung beetle. So here we've got a dung beetle, tortoise, scorpion so far. We've got the seeds from a jackal berry. Actually, no, that's, the, that's a beetle casing again. Another beetle casing. Wow, this is interesting. Here we have a, another type of beetle, not a dung beetle. That is a tuktoki beetle, a tenebryonid beetle. We've got some more scorpion coming out. It's another tail segment of a scorpion. Obviously not much nutrition in the tail itself once the meat has gone out the inside. Let's break open one of these boluses and see what's inside. So no seeds of anything, just insects, many millipedes. Now sometimes in some areas these dung piles can be filled with mice's vertebrae, ribs, teeth, claws. They will catch and kill mice. But this particular civet in this particular area doesn't seem to have much more than what we've collected here. So to go through it again, scorpions are forming a piece of the diet, baby tortoises, dung beetles, and tuktoki beetles, tenebryonid beetles, all fairly large beetles. Let's see what else is going on here. I'm dearly wanting to show you a mouse's f leg bone female tibia. Now Lucy, you've made an interesting observation. You've asked why would the millipede remains go white? Lucy, they are, they are chitin and chitin is made up of calcium carbonate mainly and calcium carbonate bleaches white in the sun. So it's the calcium that you're seeing inside there, just bleaching white in the sun. Uh, and it's because they're made of this substance called chitin, which a lot of the insects are covered with. And so that's why it goes white in this particular environment. Lots of sunshine out here. Let's see, another big beetle. Let's see if we can identify that beetle. 
What is interesting is they're only eating ground living beetles. They're not catching beetles inside trees. That would make sense, I suppose. Civets don't really climb trees if they don't have to. Break open another bolus over here. Now you notice I'm using a stick rather than my hands. And that is because civets are omnivorous and they do eat meat from time to time. And what I don't want to do is touch something's dung out here that eats a lot of meat. And some of these, some of these civet trees can get absolutely massive. Civets live for relatively long periods of time. I'm not quite sure exactly how long they live, but they definitely live for longer than a few years. And they will use these civet trees for years and years and years at a time, making these huge deposits in areas. Um, and they'll almost always be in exposed areas, and they approach these with caution. They spend a lot of time sniffing around these civet trees, making a deposit of dung and urine, and then moving off it as, as their territorial marking place. It's quite interesting, eh? Now, James, you wanted to know what's the most unusual thing I've ever found in a civet tree. James, I suppose it's, it has to be these mice um, deposits. The one civet tree that I used to visit from time to time, deep on the other side of the Kruger National Park, on the Lobombo mountain range, was on a rock. And the, these rocks had these depressions in them uh, f caused by lichen. And they used to make these cups. And this civet tree would wash over the, the season, over the wet season, and deposit bones into this variety of these little pools, basically. And then the pools would dry up in, in the winter time. And you could go there and almost put an entire skeleton together of these mice. We did the, no bones broken. It's almost like the civet caught the mouse, shook it, to break its neck and then swallowed the mouse whole and it came out the other end literally with all the bones pretty much intact still so not i mean it's not unusual but it's definitely unexpected out there let's go to this one and see so more scorpions this 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 particular dung or this particular evening was very good for scorpions as you can see there and there and there and there, and more beetles. All right, we have now finished playing in our dung pile. <laughs> I'm going to wash my hands, and we're going to send you over to Brent. He's got a surprising pride for you. So we're still within Kormas. There's not much going on here. And uh, we've just moved a little bit closer. As you can see, they're very, very relaxed at the moment. And. Uh, I know this young lion with a floppy ear is a firm favourite with lots of our viewers out there. Now that floppy ear could be from mange, it could also be from stable flies, it could also be from a physical injury. Be impossible to know for sure. I said with all these big bellies, it's very unlikely to be much movement with the pride today. Well, this morning at least. Now, <laughs> no love there. Go look somewhere else. And of course, lions and lionesses are, are quite different looking with their manes, but there is one incredible, unusual fact that they share. Now if we, oh look at that, I'll wait for them to finish playing. Oh, 
Oh, isn't that sweet? There you go, you saw that biting of the ear. So see, something like that, but a, probably a hard bite around a carcass could cause a floppy ear. But I think it's probably more to do with mange and flies, personally. As I said, we'll never know for sure. Now, Carrie's wondering, where are the male lions? And uh, why don't the lionesses have manes? Well, they don't really need manes. The, the manes are there for protection during fights. They're also there to make a male look more impressive to try avoid fights. So the bigger and scarier you look, the less likely another lion wants to fight with you. But uh, male lions fight far more regularly than lionesses and far more seriously in defensive territory. So they've got that massive bit of hair around their necks uh, to help protect the vulnerable areas around the throat and the back of the neck. Now, we're talking about, oh, here we go, this one's up. Now, some of the lines are definitely fatter than the others, but uh, overall they all look quite well fed. Now, if we look at that the end of her tail, that tuft in her tail. Now, lions are the only big cat to have a tuft at the end of their tail. And uh, there's a, a hard spine or spur that's about five mils long that's formed as the, fir, fir, the last bones of their, 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 their tailbone fuse together. Now, it's quite interesting because that no one really knows why uh, it's happened. I mean, it, it, we know it's a following mechanism, but what prompted that? And if we try, where's a cub now? Let's go try this one here. Now, we look at the little cubs. Those bones only fuse when they're about five and a half to six months old. So, and then the tufts are only really developed from seven months old. So when they're young, they don't have that very distinct tuft with the black hair and, and those bones haven't fused together. Now, of course, we know it's a very useful following mechanism for other lions to follow lions through the bush. But where it came from and why those bones fuse together uh, is quite interesting because if you think about a leopard, or it's got a white tuft, a tip to the tail, but it's not a tuft, so they don't have those fused bones. And that's also used as a following mechanism, but they haven't had to evolve that, that fusing. So it's, it's quite an interesting thing. One of those amazing little mysteries. There we go, you can see there the tuft hasn't formed properly yet, so those bones have not yet fused together. It's probably started fusing together, but we're only going to be able to see it clearly at about seven months old. Eliana is wondering when the male Inkahuma cubs grow up and get pushed from their natal or home territory by probably by the Birminghams and, and to a degree by the females themselves, will they form a coalition? It's it's very likely, I'm, I'm just trying to remember, I'm not sure, I've forgotten now how many males, how many females, but remember we've lost two and I can't remember the sexes of them. If anyone out there knows how many male cubs, how many female cubs are left out, uh, out of the six that we have. I, I'm pretty sure they're more females than males, but uh, if you know, let me know. Hashtag Safari Live or questions at wildearth.tv. Oh, some complaining. Just trying to sneak in there. Looks like it's been a success. Now, David's wondering at what age do the cubs start losing the black behind their ears? Now, I'm just trying to see if we can see the behind the lioness's ear. Let's have a look at this there. 
Now you can see it's still black there, but it's quite patchy and, and they don't really ever lose that black. It just becomes a little bit more dull. And most of that is because of biting flies actually uh, biting incessantly on their ears and causing their hair to fall out, the stable flies. Now, so far we haven't had really bad outbreaks of stable flies in this area, but uh, in other parts of Africa there have been incredibly bad outbreaks of stable flies that have caused actually uh, our lions to actually move out of an area or to even die. So and it's quite interesting and, and it happens, uh, the last place it happened most frequently was in, uh, in Tanzania and Kenya, if I remember correctly. Thirsty. Now, on average, our Kruger lions are a bit bigger than the East African lions. So, a male is around 200 kilograms, and uh, in, in this area and in, in East Africa, uh, the males are around 170 kilograms. So not not massive difference, but they are definitely on average uh, bigger animals and, and the lionesses as well <laughs> I seem to have Found an amicable peace now, not so much roaring at each other. The program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Welcome to South Africa. It was a stormy, temptuous night with howling winds. Unfortunately, not much rain. Now it's time to find out what's out and about after a long night. This is Safari Live. Ready? Standing by. Welcome, welcome, welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve here on the edge of the Kruger National Park. We're part of the eight and a half million acre Greater Kruger. I'm way down in the south of our traverse looking for a will come to love dearly. Her name is Karula and she's our dominant female. She's got two cubs presently and uh, we're hoping with that dark stormy night she's managed to make a kill. It's great hunting weather for the big cats. Uh, not so great if you're an impala or a kudu. But the one thing that is not so great for us is even that little bit of rain makes seeing her footprints that much harder. So we're gonna go have a quick look at the southern boundary. When Byron lost her she was heading south which sometimes is never a good thing because it means she might be heading towards the edge of our traverse where we've just arrived and she might cross over. I think her cubs, uh, she left them down there but let's hope she made a kill between where Byron lost her and uh, our southern boundary. So we're just going to have a little trundle up the boundary uh, see if we can find uh, any sign of her and of course this is 100% live so please send us questions on using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter uh, or you can send us an email to questions at wildearth.tv Okay Queen Karula, where are you? Now there's still quite a bit of cloud around. It looked like it was breaking up. It's gonna be interesting to see how it pans out in the morning. You can see it's quite dark in the west, but it's quite light in the east and the south. And our rain normally comes from the south and the east. Mm. 
Christmas yet. So one of those in-betweens. So I, I don't know whether it's cold or whether it's warm. But I think I'm going to put my jacket back on. It's a little bit chilly. There's a wind that's picked up. Um, it's theoretically not that cold, around 24 degrees Celsius, which is in the 70s Fahrenheit. But, oof, all of a sudden there's a chilly wind coming from the west. Are we going to get rain from the west? That would be quite unusual. So I'm guessing that if, if Karula's crossed, it's been somewhere between here and Weaver's Nest Road. So while I try scour the ground for tracks of the Queen, let's go say good morning to Byron. Good morning everyone, my name is Byron and on camera with me this morning is Jandre. Um, and I'm not too sure what our plan is going to be for the day. Uh, I think why don't some of our viewers give us suggestions, see what we should do, what would you like to see, and then we can perhaps try to do that this morning. I am going to head across to Arethusa though. I'm just doing one or two radio tests on that side, but going to be heading across there. So give us your ideas, what you'd like us to look for and then uh, it might make it a bit easier for us. Who knows? It's a nice, lovely, cool morning, and uh, that should help us with, with some animal movements. Possibly still get a lot more movement out of the animals because it is cooler. I wonder if it stays clear like this, it could become quite warm later on. While Brent is searching for Karula, he was searching yesterday and then she somehow just managed to pop out close to us. And I'm also just scanning for tracks. Ah. Elephant, yes, finally. I've been looking for elephant for how long? I'm just going to see if I can get a nice view. There seems to be a beautiful little baby there too. Hold on, maybe from this angle. There's one, one over there. There's a few around. There's a big female to the back which we can't see just yet she may come into our frame soon and she's got a little calf with her oh wonderful I was saying the whole of yesterday we haven't seen elephant in for ages and I've been looking all over for them so I'm so glad we got what a nice surprise great way to start the morning this looks like a small herd I don't see any others around at the moment. I can only count three large elephant and the one little calf. Oh, this little one just um, seems a little bit upset, possibly because that little calf is here. But that's just a more of a warning. Often you get and Philip all the way from New York. You're also hoping to see. Elephant, well, there we go. Um, now, sometimes these little teenagers, uh, um, these younger elephant, do try and test us a little bit. Uh, they want to see if we're a threat, if we're a danger, and if they're able to th chase us away. See that head shake, all little signs that it wants to try and intimidate us and get us to move away, but it's not really aggression as such. And it, as I said, it is a younger elephant, so we generally don't have to worry too much. I'd like to sit here a little bit and see if that calf does decide to come out. Still can't really see it. I get a glimpse every now and then, but we're going to wait here a bit. Lovely to see these elephants though. <laughs> windy this morning. The wind's picked up quite a bit. Sometimes it can cause elephants to be a little bit uneasy. 
purely because they rely on their sense of smell and their hearing and if it's very very windy those senses become a lot harder to use oh, I love watching elephant just the way they, they feed they're incredibly intelligent ability to use that trunk to pull out tiny little weeds or leaves that they're feeding on or grass shoots and then obviously the power that they have to be able to break branches and chew on massive stumps or, or um, branches to strip off bark really is incredible they seem as if they've settled down that one's not as worried about us anymore I always say a feeding elephant is a happy elephant and I think that female with her calf is going to be coming through there we go look there oh wonderful that's a young little one I wonder it could possibly be it's always difficult to really gauge age but uh, Judging by the size, I'd say close to a year old. Uh, Rose, newborn elephant or not born blind, they, they're born precocial, which means they are able to stand up and move around very very soon after birth so it wouldn't help if they were blind um, they, um, they obviously need to get up and move around with the herd for safety reasons so they're not born blind at all just like many of the antelope species or all the antelope species the giraffe um, buffalo zebra all those animals all the young are born precocial which means they are able to not quite fend for themselves but they're able to get up and start moving around um, with the with the female with the mother um, animals that are born ultricial which means completely helpless would be leopard cubs lion cubs um, they, you know they are born into a den and the females have to look after them for a few months they are born blind and helpless just like we we basically born ultricial completely helpless oh, breaks sorry and there they go they seem a little bit restless this morning for some reason there goes the big female with the calf oh what a lovely lovely view how quickly these elephants can move out of an area when they want to and there's still one just off to our left so I just want to keep an eye on it don't want to get between it and the and the rest that might decide to run across the road let's see just hiding behind this bush let's just wait here as I said I don't want to get between it and the other elephant that can sometimes cause the elef elephant to be a bit unhappy maybe feel a bit distressed but this one seems okay we'll see when it decides to come out into the open once it decides to follow the others which I do think might be fairly soon because the others are moving off quite quickly for some reason that female with the calf is not interested in staying out in the open she's moving away very very quickly
The young elephant has some beautiful little tusks already. Mike, uh, you wanted to know if the smaller tusks mean is it a juvenile? Oh, look at that. <laughs> running away, trying to catch up to the others now. Um, Mike, not necessarily. Um, and I, I say that because, well, generally speaking, smaller tusks, yes, you would you would imagine to see on uh, on a smaller elephant or younger elephant. Um, but occasionally, some elephant, you know, their, their tusks don't grow out at all. That can happen at times. <laughs> Look at it running off there. Um, but with a lot of the younger elephant, you do see much smaller, thinner tusks. And then obviously the older they get, they do get a lot larger, longer and thicker. Generally, generally speaking, that is what happens. Um, so occasionally with females, their tusks might not necessarily get as thick as males, but they do get quite long. Um, and, but like I said, you might find an elephant where the tusks haven't grown out at all. And that can happen and does happen on occasion. No. Look at the rain in the distance. Look at that. Beautiful. Elihu, you want to know how long do the calves stay with the mother? So with elephant, um, the young female calves, um, even the young males, they'll stay within that herd. Um, but the best i think the best way to describe it is when the when the young males leave a herd and that's usually around the age of maybe between 15 and 20 somewhere around there and they'll they'll potentially move off and meet up with the big dominant male and the reason for that is those big dominant males will help teach those younger males how to be successful where to look for food and how to find females so I just hear something in there a big dung beetle that I'll have to get out soon um, so uh, the the rest of the rest of the young elephant will stay within the herd the young females stay within that herd they just grow the numbers in terms of when the youngsters suckle from the mothers some young elephant will will continue to try and suckle from a mother anywhere up to five years even a bit longer if they're lucky they'll still try try and get some milk from the mother but generally the average is between between two and four um, where they do suckle and then they'll they'll stop but they'll stay within that herd and they'll just grow the, the size of the herd beautiful to see that rain in the distance Uh, Ali, you want to know, are there any animals in the Kruger that, uh, the, where the fathers are involved in the upbringing of the offspring? Now, now let me think, let me think. Uh, good question, Ali. Um, I definitely know of some birds, and I'll get to that now. I'm just trying to think of animals first. Um... Uh, certain animals like jackal, uh, you, like we've got side-striped jackal that we do see in this area, and they generally stay in pairs, the male and female, and the female will give birth to the pups, but um, but the male will still be around and will probably provide food for them too. So I don't know to what extent he, he, he raises the pups. So it's mainly the female's role, but they stay in small family groups, um, a small little pack of jackal, I suppose you could call it. Um, and then um, uh, wild dogs, wild dogs, I'm trying to think. Uh, see the wild dogs, you have an alpha male and female, but the whole pack looks after the female and her youngsters. So probably not. War dogs, perhaps. Um, but generally, generally the males do move off on their own after a while. Um, you might get to see a, a group where a male and a female are together with some, some youngsters. But I don't think the males really have much to do with the, the upbringing of offspring. Now birds, however, one of the best known birds for doing this is the African jacana. And I'll show you a picture of one quickly. 
um, and they are very very interesting birds the African Jacana and I'll tell you why it's because the um, the females uh, let me just find it quickly not quite the females but the males are the ones that uh, that raise the young not the females So it's funny, but the females literally mate with the males, lay the eggs, and then the males are the ones that will sit on the on the nest and incubate the eggs, and then raise the chicks. And have a look at that. That's the male or the African jacana, this beautiful bird over there. And uh, some people refer to them as lily trotters, but they, they've got the largest feet in proportion to body size than any other bird um, in Africa. So they spread their weight evenly on reeds so that they're able to walk around the water and on the water. And, um, and these birds are always, always found near water. Dams, occasionally rivers, but mainly dams and larger water holes. So this is known as polyandrous, where the males look after the chicks um, or the young and not the females. And the females may also have more than one male partner. So they may potentially have two or three different male partners that they will mate with, lay the eggs, and then the males will sit on the nest and incubate the, the chicks and look after the chicks when they, when they hatch. Isn't that interesting? Alright, and Aaron, you, um, we are heading towards Arethusa, so towards that airstrip area. Perhaps we can have a look for jackal and secretary birds down there. I know you'd like to see them, and who knows. While I head in that direction, let's head back to Brent and see how his leopard tracking is going. We're still searching for the queen. Uh, we didn't find any tracks on the southern boundary, but with the rain, it's quite easily we could have missed one. Hello, Kodu. You seen a leopard this morning? No? You look quite relaxed. Rough night last night, all those strong winds. Lightning, thunder. There you go, female Kudu. Not looking too stressed, not like there's a leopard close by. Here comes another one. Now it looks like the sun's going to win the battle today. Break up the cloud. Just want to listen for a second. Still no signs of alarm calls. No signs of tracks just yet. I'm going to check the treehouse waterhole. Now, Byron lost her going into this area, but ew, after this rain, if she walked here before the rain, the chances of us seeing a track are, are very slim. Some of the sections of the road here are quite hard. Paul, uh, Paul's wondering why we can't cross boundaries. Are those areas off limit to all vehicles uh, or are they owned by different landowners? Uh, they are owned by different landowners and our Travis agreement in this part of the Sabi Sands is only with Juma, Cheetah Plains and Arethusa. So other lodges can drive in those areas. Unfortunately, for now, we can't. Okay, we're approaching the treehouse waterhole. And there's been that not so well looking hippo he's been here for the last couple of days but maybe oh no he hasn't moved but let's get up onto the damn wall he's still here he would have been hoping for quite a lot more rain fill up his little pond
So hippos will graze at night uh, and try to return to the water during the day. Uh, try to protect themselves from the blistering African sun. Now, he's been in a battle with another hippo bull at some stage and a battle it looks like he lost. Now the ox peckers are pro proving quite the nuisance, keeping some of those wounds open so they can feed off his blood. You can see how pink and raw those wounds are, and that's almost exclusively from the ox peckers. Now Julie was wanting to come check up on this hippo. Well, here we are, Julie. Oh, shame, poor guy. Now the two animals that have taken the biggest knock from the droughts is definitely the hippo and uh, the, the buffalo. What always amazes me is the, the terrapins. I mean, they've gone through this drought, they've been hiding and keeping their heart rates low, and as soon as there's this tiny bit of water, if we look in the corner, yeah, there's, oh, oof. Difficult to say, but 20, 30, little heads popping in and out. There we go. Hello, terrapins. They've actually got quite a nasty bite on them. Now, they don't really have teeth, but their their whole bottom, their whole bone, or their whole jaw is bone, and they've got that very sharp sort of point that, at that apex of the mouth. And they are capable of quite some nips. Okay, well, bye-bye, Mr. Hippo. Bye-bye, Mr. All the Terrapins. We've got leopards to find. Morning, Aubrey. Just a uh, small clammy on Law of Mobile West at uh, Junction Philemon's Dip, Zoe's Road. Copy. Um, yeah, I've checked around Treehouse and around the boundary. I'm heading towards Twin Dams. Hi, Amber. Amber's wondering, would a hippo get sunburned if it was out of the water? Uh, it's sort of sunburned. What happens is the skin dries out and becomes quite... Uh, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for here? I'm not brittle, but it dries out quite quickly and can crack and be very painful. Now hippos secrete uh, a pinky oily substance that also works as a bit of a sunblock, but uh, they, they are specifically designed not to wander around in the day. Even though they've got incredibly thick skin, it is quite sensitive. Now still so so far no sign of a queen carula, but. We're going to keep checking. We're going to head a little bit further to the east, down towards the Mawati River. Maybe she popped down there. Oh, she could have gone any direction from that block. Now we've checked to the west and we've checked to the south. We haven't checked to the east and north yet, so that's where we're heading. And you notice we're not seeing nearly as much general game as we used to. Uh, not as much. Oh, there used to be lots of zebra around, lots of waterbuck, and uh, giraffe as well. We had quite a few buffalo, but now with the rain, they've all spread out far and wide, and they would have moved to areas that might have had a little bit better rain than us, and there's nice luscious green grass uh, there for them to feed. Also, a lot of those areas that don't have permanent water, but now with rains, those little mud wallows f fill up and it gives them an opportunity to spread into other areas and utilize other areas at a different time of the year. Hi Julia. Julia says, is there an, another name for the European cuckoo we saw yesterday? She can't seem to find it on her bird app. I think in Europe it's called a common cuckoo, Julia. 
and so a common cuckoo we call it a European cuckoo here because it migrates all the way from Europe to visit us but I think uh, in Europe it is called a common cuckoo oh you st what are you still doing out and about there we go little scrub here Got a fright from a diker and scattered off. The diker ran, the scrubber thought, well, there must be something dangerous around like a leopard. I'm out of here. So those are normally nocturnal and uh, spend their evenings out grazing on grass. And you can see those massive ears are one of their best forms of defense against predators. They've also got good eyesight. But one of the interesting things about scrubber hairs and is that they eat their own feces up to seven times so they're not uh, to enable them to get the m maximum amount of nutrients out of it as possible uh, this also enables them to utilize areas that are